Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome here to this wonderful gathering of love. It's so wonderful to have all of you here. Not so wonderful for the reason, but we're going to work through that together, aren't we? So I welcome you to the Interfaith Center for Spiritual Growth. This was a place where John attended for about the last 10 years and um, became a very, very dear friend of ours here. I'd like to begin our service this afternoon with uh, an invocation as we usually do on Sunday mornings. And so I invite you to take a deep breath. and let it out and take another deep breath and as we sit here together let us know how loved we are let us know how safe we are let us rest during this time together and let us be aware of the divine presence that is everywhere present within us, without us, all around, everywhere. There is no place where we can be where God is not. And so as we gather and we collect our thoughts this morning about our dear, beloved friend, John, let us know that we are not separate from him. It would be impossible. We are not separate from God. It would be impossible. This life in human form is brief. It is not the truth of the totality of what we are. We are spirit. We are divine. And we are here on this journey together to remember that. We are here to express the divine love that created us. We are here to forgive, to be forgiven. We are here to offer gratitude and the utmost respect for life. Our life is a gift and may we remember to use that gift well. We thank you, John, for all the love that you brought to us. And we, we know, we trust that you continue to feel our love for you. We believe you're on your next mission and that you will rise to grandeur as you did in this life. We bless you and we thank you. And we bless all who are present here today in God's name. And so it is. Amen. Welcome again. So we have a slight addition to the program. We're going to sing a song um, that we think John would enjoy. Um, it is, Tis a Gift to be Simple. It's in the songbooks that are possibly found under your chair seat in the back, tucked in. And so we're going to be sitting for a while. So we're going to stand, if you are able, stand. And together we'll join in song, Tis a Gift to be Simple. Page 70, 70.
Great. Thank you, everyone. You can be seated. There are a few empty seats back over here if some more people want to come in. There should have been. Yes, there were quite a few. Um, Greg, could you grab some programs out there and just bring them in in case some people besides Dawn need one? <laughs> So as you may gather, we're a pretty informal place, um, and um, our, our mission is to recognize the divinity within each of us and, and the expression of each one of us in sharing that divinity. So I want to have a special welcome to John's family who came here from quite a distance to be here today. Uh, it's really wonderful that you were able to make this journey and um, and you know just feel that the love that John's life extended to you know um, so many people from so many different uh, avenues um, are here today and um, we want your the family here to just know how much we love John as you did and special to Debbie who's self-described, I guess, special friend of John. <laughs> Could call her a lot of things. De dearly beloved one for John. And so as uh, this day passes, we want to keep Debbie in particular in our prayers and, and be there for her for the long haul uh, uh, to be really supportive. So, So I, I thought of a tiny little story. Uh, when my father died many, many years ago, my daughter was four, and we were gathered at a house after all the events of the day had concluded, and we had Kentucky Fried Chicken, and we're sitting around the table, and my four-year-old, you know, no one else is speaking of my dad, you know? It's as if he's not there. My four-year-old daughter says, it's a good thing Grandpa's not here because we don't have any extra chairs. <laughs> and we have, if you haven't noticed, we have a chair back there where John used to sit. And it's empty, but it's filled with his love and his spirit. And so, John, there's always a seat here for you, wherever. <laughs> so, um, so our purpose this morning for gathering is to honor and celebrate our dear friend John, our dear brother, our dear companion, our dear champion in life. John truly was a special, special being. And he did not hide his light, even though he was humble. You know, he, he went about life as I think we're called to go about our life, to very humbly extend an open, loving heart to invite people to join together. You know, he was quite the connector of people, and, you know, this room full of people attests to that. Um, he was truly remarkable. And so we, we want to speak about John today and, and remember him. We want him to know we remember him. And we want him to know his life really and truly mattered. Truly mattered, as do all our lives. And, you know, we have the opportunity to do with this life what we choose. Um, and so we gather, and as we remember John, it gives us a chance to reflect. What am I doing with my life? Am I going to have a room full of loving people coming to celebrate my life? And believe me, this room would be, there would be a lot more people here if it wasn't game day or <laughs> September 7th or, you know, because there's weekend things going on. And I mean, several of our community members are not here because they had travel plans. And so, you know, there's a whole city of Ann Arbor and who knows beyond that has 
John has had an impact on. Uh, it's pretty incredible. He hasn't even has what a, a beer named after him now from Grizzly Peak Craft Beer. <laughs> um, so we, we gather publicly to express this love that we have for him. We gather to perhaps say the things we wish we would have said to his face. How often do we just take it for granted? He must know what I think about him. She must know that I care and love, love her. Um, I'll have another day. But as we learn, we don't always have another day. Whatever it was that was the last thing we said, that was it, at least in human form. I mean, I truly believe we can still communicate and, you know, join in mind, join in spirit. But, you know, it's, it's that day-to-day -day human connection that we're grieving about, really. We're grieving our loss. Uh, we're, we miss John. And, um, and so, so we come together. We, we, we celebrate the stories. We um, celebrate the impact that he had on our lives. And we appreciate one another ever more. So, so this this sharing does, in fact, um, help with the healing process. You know, it helps us to know we're not alone; that we're here for one another, and uh, the love will go on. So I think I will say a few words now about John as he was here at this center. As I said, um, he has attended the Interface Center for about 10 years. And, you know, he was here every Sunday. Um, you know, unless he was off traveling, skiing somewhere or whatever, he was here. And he either sat back there or back there. <laughs> and. Um, there's a ritual that we have uh, in the middle of our services where we greet one another with uh, the word namaste and the, the prayers, the prayerful hands, meaning the divinity within me acknowledges the divinity within you, and we look into one another's eyes. And John was the most soulful person. You could just, you just knew that when you were into his presence, he clicked into his light. And that light just beamed from his presence through his eyes, and and it was lovely. And I know all of us remember that that have had that experience with him. Um, so so he was um, just beloved by our community. Um, you know, John was also just so giving. Uh, he, he pretty soon I. I roped him into helping us with um, decorating at Christmas time and we, we always put little trees up there on top of that area and he would climb up there and put the you know the green stuff and the lights and you know pretty soon it's like every year it was expected that you know John's gonna put that up for us <laughs> and, and he did for many years um, he was he was always attending our quarterly business meetings. He really cared about this community, and as I learned, a lot of other communities. You know, it's like he gave it his all, no, no matter where he went. Um, you know, he was a regular at our Cafe 704 concerts monthly, um, and you know, just a number of of different little cleanup projects that we would have around here. Um, he often lent us his tables for our yard sale. We always had our yard sale the week after the art fair, so he'd have all his tables ready for sales during the art fair and then, um, you know, ask if we wanted to borrow those tables for, um, for this year. Now, this year I did not ask him, uh, you know, kind of slipped my mind and sure enough, he, he emailed Randall and said, hey, did you guys forget to ask me for my tables this year? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, he well, Randall picked them up, but then he came and picked them up to take them back. So, uh, you know, just continued on and on. Uh, we have another little um, <clears throat> ritual here <clears throat> on Sunday afternoons that was originated by John, and that's having lunch at Mark's Coney Island just over the way after service. And, um, you know, again, I know he was 
often inviting people to join, join, and you know, we'd have more than one booth frequently. So, um, and then it turns out there's another other restaurants around town that John has lunch meetings at. <laughs> so, um, quite the connector. What was remarkable about John is he didn't really call attention to himself. Um, you know, about the only time he came up here and you know put himself in the limelight was uh, when there was something special happening in the sky. You know, he'd say, "Well, I'm your." sort of unofficial church astronomer and uh, I just want to let you know about whatever event it was. You know, he, I remember at least one time he brought his giant telescope out here and had us look. Might have been an eclipse or something, something that was happening in the day. Um, but he's very humble. Uh, he brought his passion for the study of the Urantia book to us and uh, had monthly meetings here for a while on Wednesdays and then just recently started up a Sunday monthly uh, gathering after services on Sunday and, um, and of course it continued at his home every Wednesday too so I know that there are um, people that are going to continue that tradition and, and uh, um, so we're glad of that. So. I think I, I want to continue next with just a prayer. This is the prayer of St. Francis, which I think is fitting in answering that question of what am I doing with my life and how am I living and am I, am I being the light that, um, that I am called to be. So I'm sure m most of us know this prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And so at this time, I'd like to call Janet Magnifico up. This is John's sister, one of John's sisters, and she has a reading. Good afternoon, everyone. This little story was written by um, our daughter, and we, we really, we thank you all so much. We thank Dallas, and we, we thank you from our family that we are given this opportunity to meet John's other family. And it means so much to us. So thank you all, really, for being here. So as I said, this is kind of funny in spots. Um, Uncle John saw things differently. He looked closely. He analyzed situations. He thought carefully about virtually everything. Sometimes that tendency was frustrating, like when he'd revise already planned plans because he thought of some new variable that no one else had quite considered yet. Sometimes it was amazing like when he volunteered to shoot our wedding video at the last moment just because he thought we might want to remember it later. <laughs> Often, it was just a different approach. The last time my husband Chris and I spent a whole day with him at Kennedy Space Center two summers back, he watched the star globe fountain turn for a long time while he tried to capture it from just the right angle. The stars are in my blood, he said. And the stars, of course, 
are in everyone's blood, since, as Carl Sagan put it, the cosmos is also within us. We are all made of star stuff. I think that most of us don't think about that, but Uncle John did. When I was 12 or 13, all of us were forced out of the kitchen to spend some time together at our summer family reunion. The youngest, Julie and Matthew and Chris, they just weren't having it. Perhaps in desperation to entertain the kids, John pulled a suction cup toy out of the pile and he stuck it in the middle of his forehead. Well, finally, the kids stopped complaining because this could become a really fun game. The suction cup wouldn't stick to anyone else's head but John's. <laughs> and the smallest cousins couldn't get enough of the hilarity of batting it around, trying to dislodge it from his skull. By the time they got bored, a stubborn red suction cup bruise had marked his forehead. And in the family reunion photos, which you can see outside if you look carefully, a hint of the red circle shows up. Later, many years later, I stopped through Ann Arbor while visiting graduate programs, and beyond showing me the rings of Saturn through his telescope, I learned about John's life and his business. Amazon had just begun to worry small business owners, but he'd noticed that the Ann Arbor skate kids bought shoes too. Some of them worked at his store and they had to, and they had cash to spend on skateboards from part-time jobs, but no credit cards to use on the internet. He started stocking skater gear and at the time I remember wondering what it must feel like to own a store while, stop, while shopping was changing so quickly, but he never seemed upset. He learned about skate shoes and brands and styles they liked and how close he really was to the skate park. And the skate kids taught him about their ideas and the local scene. And he started to see them and listen. Uncle John saw things differently. And he always wanted to share what he saw and how he was going to remember that time. His communities, his family, his friends, his star watching buddies and students, his skater customers, they were everything to him. And he was always happy to show up and participate. If a family reunion opportunity started to come together, even a last minute one, he'd be on a plane and whatever perspectives and ideas he happened to be thinking about or reading at the time, he truly believed that all of us, maybe especially the people he loved most, are made of star stuff. And someday, we'll all go back there to the sky. Thank you. I'm Janet's husband, Michael, and I'm obviously a brother-in-law. And as an embellishment of his relationship with our children, his nieces, there's a special musical term. Who is familiar with Peter Shickley? So Peter Shickley is a very talented musicologist and a humorist, the creator of PDQ Bach. One of the PDQ Bach CDs we're most familiar with, and I'm getting the eye from my wife here, <laughs> identifies some newly created Christmas carols by PDQ Bach. One of the favorite ones was, throw the U log on, comma, Uncle John. Whenever we spoke of Uncle John, or Uncle John came to visit, he was instantly transformed, newly named as throw the U log on Uncle John. One of the ways that he is remembered with us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. And Roberta, would you like to come up now? This is John's sister, Roberta Ruppel. Um, 
our brother, John, Jack, to all of us in our youth, altar server, paper boy, boy scout, rather accomplished accordion player, and wonderful student, two very proud parents, and five brothers and sisters mostly in awe of him. When going to study physics at the University of Detroit, he attended on a fencing scholarship. And during the Vietnam War, he was a conscientious objector and worked as a hospital orderly. John loved his family and worked to stay in touch with all of us and extended family as well, aunts, uncles, cousins, and old friends. I'd often say to people, my brother John had more friends than Princess Di. He loved people. He loved to engage. He loved to gather people. He loved food and beer and parties. And John loved to document it all. He loved to capture the moment and share it back with us. It's a mini miracle that there is a photo of John to enjoy because typically he was always behind the camera. John had a great sense of humor. He was playful and goofy. He had great fun with his nieces and nephew and they were charmed by him and referred to John as Uncle Shoe Stars. John was an astronomer, a runner, a man of great faith. He was thoughtful, gentle, humble, kind, generous, and quite brilliant. Each one of you, every one of you, was special to John. Ann Arbor was his home and you were all John's extended family. His life here was full and rich and he loved it. In my last conversation with John the day before he died, one of the final things he said to me was, Roberta, I don't understand why the world is so competitive, why we can't all cooperate more, work together, and be more kind to one another. Beautiful thoughts to leave with me and to all of us, John's legacy, cooperate, work together, be kind. John was a special man and brother and we'll miss him. I don't know how well I'll express this, it's not written down, um, and it's a little bit of a variation on what's been said already, but it occurred to me that we're all aware of all the efforts that John put out with his whole heart in, in every direction, and in addition to the reaching out, he had a perceptual filter that was to see need of any kind in anyone, and no matter what he was going through in his life, he would not hesitate if it was in his power to fill that. Um, but something that you might not all know is that it was not unusual for him to say to me, I need to do more. I need to reach out more. He was dismayed by how what he had not done. And we know that's pretty nutty, but I tried very hard not to say, are you nuts? <laughs> I, don't was, I don't know if I was always successful. But the thought from this, and again, this is not entirely new, but it occurred to me that this gives him the opportunity to achieve that. Because there's, there's things that are pulling in our head in, in, in all directions. We have more than we can keep track of. But this brings in sharp relief the things that we know about John and what he valued and what he tried so hard to achieve. And many of us are already working in those directions, but this can be a huge ripple effect that everybody here 
can carry out what he was trying to do, but in a far wider way. Thank you. John, we love you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Well said. So we're going to open it to open mic in just a moment, but uh, there's a poem in the program that Janet uh, sent to us, and I like us all to read that together out loud. It's, I am with you. I am with you still. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. And the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the sweet, uplifting rush of the birds in circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not think of me as gone. I am with you still in each new dawn. Okay, thank you. And actually we have a musical selection next. So John's dear friends, Yasu and Yumi Enugi, are going to play. Drops of Jupiter, it's called. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Um, on each holiday throughout the year, John would have a dinner party and uh, a lot of people gather for the dinner and after the dinner is done, uh, we sit around and sometimes I play music, sometimes with uh, my wife Yumi and uh, um, we, we, uh, we enjoy John. John would sit around, and um, a lot of times I maybe mess up or sing badly, but he would cheer up, and he would uh, uh, he would just smile, and so we enjoyed it um, that moment. I myself is an astronomer also, and uh, uh, a lot of times he had um, we, we have countless memories uh, watching start with him. And he, when at his driveway, he invited a lot of people, and which we looked through his telescope. Or um, sometimes we had uh, made trips up north together with him for stargazing. And as a matter of fact, uh, the first place I met him, maybe like 14 years ago, uh, was at his driveway. It happened uh, that the last time I saw him was also at his driveway just a few days before he passed. Um, so, um, I uh, know he might be out here somewhere uh, in there and uh, might be watching us, listening to us. So I would like to, uh, we'd like to sing this song for him. Uh, the song is called Drops of Jupiter. He's back in the atmosphere with drops of Jupiter in his hair. Hey, 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 hey. He acts like summer and walks like rain. Reminds me that it's time to change. Hey, 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 hey. Since the return of the city on the moon, he listens like spring and he talks like June. Hey, 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 hey. 
Tell me, did you sail across the sun? Did you make it to the Milky Way to see the lights all faded and heaven is overrated? Tell me, did you fall from a shooting star? One without a permanent scar And did you miss me while you were Looking for yourself out there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now he's back from the soul vacation Tracing his way through the constellation Hey, 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 hey He checks out most of what he does, Taibo reminds me that there's room to grow, hey, 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 hey. Now he's back in the atmosphere, I'm afraid that he might think of me as playing no part of the story about a man who is too afraid to fly, so he never did land. Tell me, did the wind sweep you off your feet? Did you finally get a chance to dance along the light of day and head back to the Milky Way? And tell me, did Venus blow your mind? Was it everything you wanted to find? And did you miss me while you were looking for yourself out there? Na 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 can you imagine the love Friday? Fried chicken, your best friend, always sticking up for you. Even when I know you're wrong, can you imagine the fast dance, freeze dry ramen, five a phone conversation? The best soy latte that you ever had in me. Tell me, did the wind sweep you off your feet? Did you finally get a chance to dance along the light of day and head back to the Milky Way? And tell me, did you sail across the sun? Did you make it to the Milky Way to see the light so faded and heaven is overrated? And tell me, did you fall from a shooting star? One without a permanent scar? And did you miss me while you were looking for yourself? Na 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 And did you finally get a chance to dance along the light of day? Na 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 And did you fall from a shooting star? Fall from a shooting star? Na 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 did you finally get a chance to dance along the light of day? Na 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 did you fall from a shooting star? Fall from a shooting star once again. Na 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 na. And did you finally get a chance to dance along the light of day? Na na na. Na 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 And did you fall from a shooting star? Fall from a shooting star? Na 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 And then you lonely looking for yourself out there Thank you so much, Yasu and Yumi. That was beautiful. What a perfect selection. So now is the time that I invite any of you to um, to speak about what you what John was in your life. Just a, a sweet memory, a funny story, a loving remembrance, whatever. Um, I'm going to pass around the mic. You don't have to come up here. You can stay where you are. And I keep in mind, we, we all want to hear these stories, you know. It's, it's always very heartwarming to hear. Uh, 
I heard and agreed with all the adjectives that were used to just, I'm, I'm Marilyn L, and I was one of the lunch bunch. And I also was a member, I also am a member of the center here, and I was and always will be a friend of John. Um, I started to say, I agree completely with all the adjectives that were used to describe John today, but I could sum up all I know of John in one word that isn't often used with men, but certainly could be with John. He was one of the sweetest people I have ever known, and I was privileged to be his friend. Hi, I'm Janice. Good job, Yashu Yumi. I couldn't have done a crime myself, that's for sure. I've known John since the 80s, and I want to say that John opened his heart and his home to everybody. And every holiday, actually you've gotten a lot better over the years. <laughs> we would have food, we've had music, and when John was looking for his house, he considered we talked about it, Janet and I and John, and I said, wow, that's a lot of money. I said, we could have great parties at your house. <laughs> As it was, I had a yoga party for my 40th birthday. We had my mother's birthday. We had my family. We had his, all his friends and family, and I would walk in maybe at a holiday and wonder, who are these people? <laughs> and they were all John's friends. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Depressed. I was a good friend of John's. John was a special person. And if you knew John, if you knew John for any length of time and spent any time at all with John, he made you feel like you were special. Always. Whatever you had to tell him, he was interested. It didn't make a difference what it was. He had time for you. And John always gave of his heart. I never met a man that was more generous or a more beautiful soul than John. He'll be missed by all of us. I met John when I became a lowbrow a university lowbrow astronomer. And John was, John was collecting telescopes at the time. A particular brand he liked was made by a man by the name of Bruce Rubin. John bought a 12 inch scope from him, a 14 inch scope from him, a 16 inch scope from him, a 10 inch scope from him, and an 18 inch scope from him. Now, it turns out that Bruce Rubin was going through a rather messy divorce, and there was a rumor going around that John was buying these up just to keep the assets away from Bruce's wife. But <laughs> we're, not, we're not exactly sure if that's the truth or not. But John was that kind of person. He found something that he loved, and he gave everything he had of himself to it. He always had a place in his heart for whatever you wanted to do. Um, I heard a story here about somebody, about John taking time and uh, analyzing situations. That was John, all right. He was, he was a little slow to work on some things, but he eventually got to them, and he always put a lot of thought into it. I own one of the scopes that John had. He sold it to me. Um, I went to the Texas Star Party with him. We flew out to El Paso and rented a car together and drove down to Fort Davis, Texas. John coordinated, I don't know how many different events we put together up in Atlanta, Michigan um, with 
again, astronomers. John was very much into astronomy. He was into everything that he was into, and he was into it fully. He gave his whole heart to it. John is somebody that I'll, I'll miss for a long time. Thank you. Last year or so, this was my seat as videographer at, at Interface Services, and next to me was John. Uh, had lunch with him roughly a couple times a week. And, uh, you know, when he heard he died, I, after the initial shock, it was like, okay, how. Is this going to affect my life? What, what are the holes? What's missing now? Just, the, you know, certain topics of conversation, John was the go-to guy for me, and it was so convenient. He was so easy to talk to. I felt like he was a brother. So I started looking at my other people in my life. Okay, let's see, for politics, I can talk to so-and-so. For, for phone issues, I can talk to so-and-so, maybe. But John and I had the same phone, whatever. Uh, he, and he, yeah, as others have said, he, he was so, always so happy to help. Uh, anyway, I, I miss him. And I'm so happy to find out that the beer that's named after him is worthy of his name. <laughs> All right. I'm going to sit down. <clears throat> uh, last Wednesday night, I think it was, was a pretty night and there between the trees, there was about a half moon, and off the cusp of the moon was uh, some planet. And I always asked John, or I would have asked John, what planet that was, and he would never belittle me. <laughs> he was very patient with me. But his depth of knowledge on those subjects were, was fascinating, and he would show me galaxies and universes and under magnification, it was pretty astonishing. But, but really, that's not what I want to say. I just want to say that John might be up there, whether it was Venus or Mars, I don't know, but he's probably up there looking down on us right now. My name is Kathy, and uh, like many of you here, I've met a lot of wonderful people through John. I thought it would be nice to keep the tradition going by having once a year a John party at Kensington. So if your contact information is up there. I'm gonna step up here because my hands will shake. The gentleman someone asked his name was Glenn Grubb. My name's Marie Johansson, and I met John more than two decades ago. And it was at a dance here in Ann Arbor, which a lot of you might be familiar with, Contra Dance, and it was Dawn Dance. So he was there at the dance. He's not a real dancer, but he was there, <laughs> and we met. Closer, okay, I'm sorry. And, and so, through all these years, you know, 20 some years have passed, and John has remained a friend of mine. He's been in my life as a friend, as a companion, as my computer guru. I don't know what I'm gonna do now. But he was also a, tr a fellow traveler, skier, biker, um, camper, and paddler, canoe or kayaks. And, 
and it was, you know, really wonderful memories that I'll have with him and our groups of friends. But you know, when I think about John, I'm reminded, as it's been mentioned before, of his talent, his passion, his interest in gathering people together, and his role in fostering community and connection. So I've almost come to think of John here recently as a shepherd, a shepherd of men and women. I actually looked up the definition, and the definition reads, a shepherd or sheep herder is a person who tends, herds, feeds, or guards herds of sheep. I don't really mean to imply that all of us as friends are sheep, but, you know, the, the, the definition fits so well because John really is someone who tended to us. He herded us together. He fed us. And in so many ways, he guarded us in, in, in our own individual relationships with him. He was a deeply religious and insightful, introspective, and thoughtful man. And his flock included groups of people who shared his values, groups of people who shared his interests, and people who shared his beliefs, or people who were wandering and just needed a place to go. John loved to be in connection with others, and others were drawn into his life because of his gentle invitations. They were drawn because of his kindness, because of his openness, and I think most of all because of his accepting, non-judgmental acceptance and attitude towards life and everyone. John loved to bring people together and he was committed to make those gatherings happen as we all have heard. We've all been part of his gatherings in one way or another. To me it seemed like he was the center of an orbit, keeping people connected, keeping people interacting and sharing. And the people who somehow entered John's life often remained in his life for many, many years, as you hear here. So many people have known him for decades. And those of us who entered, we remained in that orbit, out of our shared activities, our shared purpose, our shared values and beliefs and our connections. John's way was always gentle and peaceful. He was never one to force a situation or an outcome. He opened doors and invited people to enter. He wanted people to join in and share. He opened minds of others by not just sharing his inspired thoughts and ideas, but more importantly, how he actually modeled his life and how he led his life. And finally, John opened hearts with his generous spirit because he was an example of one whose heart was truly open to everyone. Words cannot begin to express the loss that we all feel with John's absence. His absence from my life and the life of the community of people here who knew him, his flocks, leave many of us feeling a bit lost and vulnerable and less connected. We might wonder, where's our shepherd? Where's our gatherer? Where's our friend? I don't know. He's here, somehow, he's here. But I'll just repeat what Debbie had said. We love you, we miss you, and we will continue our wanderings until our paths, our footprints, cross again.
if this is going to work, I'd rather use this. Uh, I'm a lawyer, and I always have to stand behind something to talk to a public group. Uh, my name is John Holsinger. Uh, I'm a distant friend of Jack's, uh, distant in, in, in uh, miles, because I live in New Jersey. And I met a young boy at 15 years old in 1963 as a junior in high school. His name was Jack. He later transformed into John, the John that you all love and know. I'm, I'm privileged to be here and to share with you our love of John and Jack. It was about five or six years ago that I sat back in that back row with John uh, at one of your services on a Sunday. And I may have met many of you, and I, I treasure being here again. Jack and I had a relationship that started really nur being nurtured and developed right after we graduated from college. But we were about 600 miles away from each other. And so uh, in the days before the internet, and when neither of us could afford to travel, and neither of us could afford even phone call, long distance phone calls, the only way you could really communicate at some depth are letters. I kept a number of them. Some of them go back to 1970. I hadn't looked at them for probably a quarter of a century. And when I heard that Jack had died, I dug him out. We shared a lot in very formative years as young adults, searching for our authentic selves. And they're deeply personal. But as I was reading through the various letters in the last few days, and particularly when I realized that I could be here with you all, I thought maybe I could share some of Jack's words from him to me, but that may well speak to all of us. So if you will. This is from uh, September 30th, 1975. Jack was uh, spending some time at a monastery in Canada searching for his authentic self. And he wrote me what was like a 15-page letter over time. And I'm just going to read a couple of passages of his words to me, but it seems to me that they speak to all of us, and that's why I'm sharing them with you. I'm convinced I can keep growing here for a while yet, probably to a depth, question mark, not so quickly, possibly otherwise. It must be the lack or minimum of the usual negatives we all don't realize we're struggling with. Like here, maybe it's more like the same old fertile ground of human possibles but not so many brambles to push through. To think what it must be like to be with only ground and no weeds crowding. Best way I can describe it for me, gathering scattered energies, attentive silence. What do I feel right now? Body quiet, being in self-touch, sensing the fuller me, universe always trying to re relevantly inform. Like Augustine, love and do what you will. Oh, yes, as he ends. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay. 
Who else would like to speak? This is just going to be real quick. I'm Mary. I'm John's middle sister. And, um, but we also have two brothers that are not here. And I just wanted to let you know, Leonard, our um, younger brother, ha John's passing has probably saved his life because Leonard has been diagnosed with the same type of anomaly that John passed from. And if this had not happened, Leonard may not have ever known about it. So I thought that that was something that you should all at least be aware of. Because sometimes, and I know this deeply, we don't understand why these things happen and why we lose the ones that we love so much. And sometimes there are very good outcomes from that. Our other brother, Christopher, is in Arizona. He was the youngest. When John moved away, pretty much, Christopher was 18 months old. And so being here today, for me, and I think for my sisters and my brother-in-laws, I've learned so much about my brother I never knew. And I want to thank you all for sharing that, because we love him very much. I wasn't uh, intending to speak. Uh, my name is Cheryl Glicker, and uh, I consider John my pro uh, mentor, my spiritual mentor. I began reading the Urantia book when I was 45 years old, and it took me a long time to get through it. But I did eventually get through it, and then I let it kind of just sit and germinate for years while I wondered who on earth has also read this book until I finally took some action to find someone else who had read this book. And when I did that, John was the first person I connected with. And he immediately invited me to his weekly study group in Ann Arbor. And I went. I, nothing would have stopped me <laughs> from going there. Um, and I experienced that first study group, it was like a whole new world opened up to me. And I experienced John's generosity, hospitality, and above all, his humility. Because at some point during that study group, I uh, remarked that one needed to be a combination of a theologian, an astrophysicist, and a biblical scholar in order to understand this momentous revelation. And he sat back and looked at me and he said, Cheryl, I am a physicist. <laughs> and I'm an astronomer. And I don't understand it. <laughs> and I can't begin to tell you how much better that made me feel. Um, but I live in Milford, which is a good 45-minute drive from John's house in Ann Arbor, on a good day, with no traffic. And over the years, I found attending his weekly study group in the wintertime more than a bit of a challenge. So I began to think about establishing my own study group. But I didn't quite know where I was going to find readers in the area where I live. So the universe, being the way it is, managed to create all of that to happen for me. And John was overjoyed when I established that study group and he fostered it and he supported it and he encouraged me. And every time I got discouraged and overwhelmed and tired of having to do it, when I didn't want to do it, when I was too busy, whatever, and he would say, oh no, Cheryl, you, you got to keep studying. That's a tremendous study group you've got going there. You've got people there that you just don't find on every corner. You just and so he would bring people every month on a Sunday after he had been up all night in the driveway watching the stars, and then he'd been to Interfaith for the service and the potluck, and he would bring people from Interfaith or from wherever to my study group just to keep me going. John was a lover of people, and he did not love people as a man or as a brother. 
He loved all of us as God loves us. He got there. He embodied it. He showed us all. And I feel a tremendous responsibility and a renewed enthusiasm to keep going. That's what I remember. That's what I take with me. I take John with me. He's here. He's here inside me. He's here inside each and every one of us. He hasn't left us at all. Hi, my name is uh, Jim Gould, and uh, John um, brought me around to many of his groups. Um, and I think the first time I met John was at uh, Renaissance Unity in Warren, and uh, he introduced me to his group there, Cosmos and Spirit, which I attended for a while. Uh, he invited me to his uh, gatherings at his house, his celebrations. I would go to those. And uh, then he moved his uh, business footprints in Ann Arbor, uh, two doors down from where I was working at my sister's uh, store, Falling Water Books and Collectibles on Main Street. The work I did there, for the most part, was uh, after hours. Falling Water was open seven days a week, and anything that had to be done was late at night. Uh, so, let's see, I, I was going to mention the, the different uh, circles. John, uh, I guess what I would say, what I finally learned about him was he was a lover of relationships. And he had all of these little groups. Uh, the only one I think I didn't touch base with was his uh, running club. However, I do have a story to share with those in the running club. It may be uh, a shock, I don't know. Uh, or maybe it was a joke uh, on me. But uh, I did some running, uh, been away from it a little bit. Uh, but uh, I guess what I didn't mention is I'm an artist. So I was sharing with John one time that when I run, uh, I would uh, get lost in the, in the clouds, in the treetops, uh, and it would take my mind away from any agonizing I was having in my running. And he kind of had a shocked expression on his face, and he said, oh my gosh, I wish I could do that. And I said, really, you can't? And he said, no. And he said, uh, I hate running. <laughs> to, which, to which I kind of scratched my head and, and, wait a minute, you're the one that talked to me about having done marathons, and, and uh, I knew that he had a a weekly uh, or many times during the week practice of going down to the U of M and running and uh, then it started to dawn on me what made this guy tick and it truly was it was relationship it was the love that he had with all of these people and all of these groups um, that meant everything to him and for those in the area that uh, knew about Falling Water Books and Collectibles, it folded uh, a few years back. And um, my journey that I would come to work from, I live up in the Davis and Flynn area. And um, so my trips down here weren't near as many as certainly they used to be when I was uh, 
taken care of the store. Um, and sorely, I got farther and farther away from the groups and uh, lunches we had and, and uh, late night uh, beers. Um, this is a little uh, discombobulated, but uh, bear with me. So I guess I didn't say uh, the, the, all of these circles, uh, I feel like, and, and there were probably other little tiny circles, but I felt like John and, and I had a little tiny circle because uh, late at night is when he would do his uh, books and we were, uh, you know, three doors apart, and so late at night I would be drying carpets or uh, erecting uh, new store furniture or doing something, uh, painting the mural on the walls, and uh, more than not, I knew I could catch John out uh, back, and I'd, uh, you know, if I was getting a little antsy, I'd be in the alley there and take a little stone because footprints was locked up but if I saw a light on there I'd throw a stone up on the window there and get his attention and then we'd uh, take a little time out to uh, to talk and uh, and share in our own little circle um, and when I heard of uh, him making his uh, transition uh, and I certainly applauded the way that he did it. It was like, boom, I'm out of here. Uh, I don't. I, I, I picked up a little bit from people, and and all of you who have shared the love with John over the years. Uh, if you haven't already, I, I invite you to uh, uh, just kind of open yourselves up because. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I've been visited. Uh, I look up in the sky, and uh, oh, here I go. I'm going to segue again. Uh, attending uh, Lowbrow. Uh, I was there, guys, a couple of times uh, late at night um, and cold. And um, uh, he had his big scope out, and, and, and I told him, I said, I want to see the moon. And he said, see the moon? He said, it's a rock. And I said, well, yeah, but uh, I want to see the moon. And, and he humored me, and eventually um, I saw the moon. And yes, through the scope, it's a rock. But uh, through the atmosphere of that uh, night sky, it's, it's much, much more than that. It's, there's an energy there that, uh, that uh, it speaks to me. I think it speaks to a lot of people, and uh, uh, since he's made his uh, transition, it's, uh, there's little things, uh, and I, I think John is kind of uh, agreeing with me now that uh, it's, there's certainly more there than just a rock. Um, so, uh, yeah, his circles, lowbrow, uh, urantia, um, Cosmos and Spirit Running Club. Um, I tried the Urantia. I've the Course in Miracles, uh, Course of Love, uh, the Way of Mastery, and uh, I see John in all of those. So uh, don't give up that relationship. It still exists. Thank you. I think that that's probably a good time for us to, uh, to transition to the next room. And we can continue our stories and our sharing there. And there's plenty of food um, in the, the large classroom out there. But um, let's just, I'm always jumping ahead. Let me turn this off. So I'll speak about that. We're, we'll have uh, the family get in line first for food and there's plenty of chairs out there where you know, we can circle them up and you know, do whatever. You can bring food back in here if you want. Um, 
And so we're just going to have a closing prayer, and then Alora will play some music for us as, um, as we're keeping John in our hearts and in our minds and just remembering all, all this love that we have shared today. And so I would say we have big shoes to fill in John's absence in form here, but I would also say, and I think he would want me to say, every single one of us is special and unique and a gift to this world. And so it's not that we need to be what John was. We need to be ourselves, And we need to be ourselves bigger than we've ever imagined we could be because each one of us holds that spark and each one of us holds that same divine open-hearted love that John showed to us. And so we honor and respect John. I know he honors and respects each one of us and is cheering us on in some way. And so I invite you to, again, let's close our eyes and, and let us be so grateful that we've had this time together. Let us acknowledge our gratitude for our dear brother John and all that he expressed in this life in so many ways. We are grateful for John's family. We hold them in our hearts and prayers and trust that their journeys will be made light and easy. And we hold Debbie in our heart and we vow that we shall support Debbie through this and beyond. And let us remember one another and support one another always. That's what we're here for. We are here to love, to be loved, and to be the best that we can possibly be. And we don't do this alone. We do this as it is the will of God. It's the will of God for us to come to know our will is his will. And we are blessed always. And we say thank you. Thank you, God. Amen. Okay, so, Laura. And so we can begin. Janet, do you want to start leading people uh, to the food? Thank you all for being here.